kind of rule, but I'm pretty sure you could use one to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's first of all take a look at it. If we put the whole thing, let's say we get the whole thing over here on the rough, then we're going to have our friction force, if the entire thing is on the rough, surface, then this friction force is going to be equal to our mu k times our normal. Now the normal then would be the entire weight, wouldn't it? Mu k times the entire weight. Now the entire weight is made up of rho g l. So that's the weight of the whole chain. And then we have load p acting over here. Now, if we equated those statically, no acceleration, then the p would be this value. Now, was there an answer provided in this problem in the book or not? No. What did I put in my notes? Well, we've got some normal, piece of normal here. But here's, the, here's the entire weight of the chain up here, rho GL. Here's the portion, the normal on the rough surface. Here's the friction on the rough surface. We have all that. And then look what I ended up writing over here. Can you see that? Any idea how I got to this? Um, we have a function of acceleration um, in terms of position. So we can hit it with differential equations that okay. might not be too nasty. That's what I was thinking we would need to do. So we have an expression here for acceleration. However, it involves P. So Daniel, how would you? It involves P. That acceleration expression would involve this P. <coughs> what did my notes indicate there? Can you see that up there on the right over here? I have a velocity expression here involving P. So why don't we do just what you suggested? Why don't we go ahead and take that acceleration expression, even though it involves that P, and see where that math takes us? So if we come back over here and observe when a portion of it is on the, is on the rough surface, then we have this equation, which gives us an acceleration as a function of position x, which happens to involve the p minus the mu k rho g x divided by rho l. Which I might just separate into separate terms. So p over rho l minus, and then we'll eliminate at least the row out of here, mu k gx, and I'll just leave the x off on the side there, over <coughs> L, and then use VdV equals ADx. A sub x dx. And integrate this from initial speed 0 to final speed v. And we knew the initial position on it was at 0. And then we want to let this thing go up until x equals all the chain just resting now on the rough surface. So x equals l in this drawing up above here.
the chain is now resting at x equals l, or not resting, but it's in now in motion under the action of force P. And so here's our differential equation using this expression for the acceleration. Right? Okay. So we crank this out, and on the left side, we get one half of our V squared. Over on the right side, we integrate that, and we get P over rho L x minus mu k g over L x squared over 2 evaluated between the lower limit, 0, upper bound, L. Yes. Oh, Julie? Why is P over rho L not a constant? It is. So when you pull it out of the... Well, it's not part of that other term. Oh, okay. P over rho L is not part of that one. So okay. I just treated it as a separate term up front here, separate term up front. And then when we integrate that over X, we have to, we get a P over rho L X. The first term in our antiderivative here. Followed by this linear term being integrated over X becomes quadratic. Then we apply the fundamental theorem and move our V over. And if I move the 2 over in there and apply the upper bound, at the lower bound it zeroes out. So only at the upper bound will it occur. So then our V expression is going to be this, the expression you see in the notes over there. So we end up with a 2P over rho. L over L reduces out on the upper bound. And then in this term, L squared over L reduces, and the twos reduce, and we get a minus mu k g L. That should agree. Yeah, that's what you see in the notes. But we're not done. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Um, regarding, this in regarding this integration, we're assuming that P is constant and has a value sufficient to keep the chain moving at a constant speed once it's all on the rough surface. Correct. But, but why must we assume that our, our P is going to be constant? Because at the very beginning, when we're just pulling the chain onto the rough surface, no way that we need the full value of P that we need later. That's true. So P is going to have to grow to compensate for the ever larger friction force, right? Yeah. So P is going to have to grow. And then just before, like Ian was mentioning, just before that, that tail end part of the chain that's still on the smooth surface uh, leaves the smooth surface, we're still building up the P force. So the P force is going to be that value that exists right when we right when we leave transition onto the rough surface. And what they wanted to know is what's the minimum force required? The, the minimum force we required there would be now, the Now, I think the assumption is going to have to be, the assumption we have to make to address your, the issue you just raised is what about this minimum P force from the time we started the problem to the end? P is P is going to be a function of, of x unless we just say it's constant. Yes, P would be a function of x unless we make the assumption that we're just going to grab hold of that chain initially with that minimum P force and take off, run it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we have to make that assumption that that P force, that minimum required P force remains constant because otherwise, as you observed, that's going to become a function of x in here, and we don't know what that description would be, and that would make the problem a little more intractable. Got the idea? I don't know if you followed that or not. But the friction force gets stronger as you pull the chain across. Friction force gets stronger, which, as Daniel observed, means that the P force has to continue to grow. And so the assumption we have to make in this problem is that this, we're going to, matter of fact, to clarify the wording of the question, they should have probably said, what's the minimum constant P force required? Acceleration okay. is going to start. And, 
And the subtlety of that doesn't come up until after you start playing with the problem and start looking at the mathematics here. Most people probably wouldn't cue in on that. So our acceleration is going to start at a maximum and then decrease to zero by the time it crosses over out to the right. Yes, that nice observation. The acceleration is going to be greatest initially, and then it's going to diminish as this thing moves out and moves over. As a matter of fact, you could, see this is going to be a constant, right? We've made the assumption that this is the critical P force that's going to be constant. Take a look at this equation here, folks. Look at the structure of it. What is it? A is a function of x. It's a linear function. It's a linear function. Nice observation. If we would draw that acceleration as a function of x, and here is L, the initial value here at zero would be, um, there's, here's the slope actually here. At x equals zero, the initial value here is going to be p over rho l. Here's your y-intercept. And the slope of that line is going to be this thing. When this reaches l, when, this equals, when x equals l, what, what should that thing be? Where should that lie? Shouldn't it lie right there? And if you put that in there, let's see what you'd get. Uh, A sub x at x equals L. You get P over rho L minus mu K rho G. <coughs> L over rho L. Rho L reduces out. And you're left with P over rho L minus mu K G. I think, I think that, that's going to be your acceleration value right there. there. Is that going to be zero? Equal to zero, you can solve the yeah, set that. Actually, something's fishy there because that's not zero, is it? The acceleration at L. Well, actually, that's going to be yeah. And so, right there, then we could set that equal to zero, and or we could let. Yeah, actually, we have to let that be L right here and set this equal to zero. And so what that's going to be, if I make that equal to zero, solve for P, then this would finish the problem out. And it looks like it's going to be a mu K rho G L. Is that it? Did I do the math right if, if I kick that term over? OK. And I don't know if I wrote that in my notes or not. Oh, they got L over 2 in my notes up there on the, in the book. <laughs> oh, well, I don't want to spend any more time on this. I think we beat it to death. But um, I will investigate that. And there was another point that Julie, we were talking about a uh, home, homework problem from a few days ago, and I have not figured that one out yet. There's a, there's a, a debatable point about which approach is right on one of the homework problems, and I'll try to get to that. I've, I've played with it a little bit, but I'm still not getting clarity on it. There's actually one more homework problem that, like, when I do the math, when you just crank through the math, I get a positive, and they have a negative value in here. Okay. Which one was it? Um, 143 on page 74. I got the same thing. So yeah, a couple of people have got the One, 143? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, I changed that in my book. Okay, so it is supposed to yeah. be positive. Yeah, so in your homework there on 143, the theta double dot term should be positive. So we don't want to make you nervous when you're doing your homework. You're probably anxious enough as it is. This is back on page 74, number 143. Theta double dot. 
positive. Okay. <laughs> Ian got negative, which agreed with the book. Maybe Ian's right and the rest of us are wrong. <coughs> Come see me on that, Ian. We'll look it over. Okay. Conceptually, yeah. it makes sense that it would be positive. Yeah, so. yeah I think so. going to start out changing toward the positive, but very slowly, and then whip around as the thing goes by, mm -hmm. the origin. Yep. So we'll... Uh, I'll, I'll investigate that a little more. Just assume that it should be positive unless you hear otherwise. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, let's grab a problem like, here's one that looks like it would be interesting. Uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to, which one I want to do. Yeah. Let's do this one. Over here. And I'll bring that up a little more. So we have a 40 kilogram mass resting on a surface, and then we have a pulley mechanism, which is going to give a two to one, two to one mechanical advantage compared to that tension. And at the same time, at the same time that there's the two to one, the double, in other words, double the tension going on is pulling up here at this 30 degree angle. And as you mentioned, Dylan, the vertical component of this loading on the cables is going to decrease the normal force exerted, which then thereby would reduce the required friction force to create motion. Right. Thank God. Yep. Okay. You get a little anxious if we allow this angle to be changing. Maybe let this thing be out here. So let's say this is up at one meter, and let's say this is 20 meters, and then it moves to five meters. Now, we'll be able to tackle that kind of a problem later, but we're not quite there yet, okay, to allow for that variable angle, okay. So, Let's go ahead and tackle it. Why don't you folks take a moment to try to assume x is to your traditional right, to the right here, and assume y is upward. And why don't you folks write your equations of motion for that block being treated as a particle. And I'll erase the board while you're working on it.
correct. So I think you can eyeball this, as I heard a couple of you doing, is there's 100 newtons upward due to the tension in the cables, 100 newtons upward because of the sine of 30 there, being a half. And there's roughly 400 down. So there's a, a net, roughly a net 300 down, which is going to be pretty close to your normal force upward. And the traditional X y axis. And we want to figure out the acceleration of this block, neglecting the masses of the pulleys. And we have a 0.5 and 0.4 coefficients of friction. So to overcome friction, the critical required friction force, notice you have not seen me on free body diagrams writing mu normal. The only time you want to write the mu normal is if you're for sure in motion. Because if there is only a net, if there is only a net, say, um, 50 newtons to the right, then this force would be equal to 50 newtons. 60 newtons to the right, 60 newtons. When it gets to that critical value is when this would lock in at the mu normal. So only if you know motion is happening, only in that situation would you put uh, that on your free body diagram if you know you have motion occurring. Okay. So the critical force then required is going to be the static coefficient times the normal, which is going to be equal to summing forces vertically, no acceleration like we've seen in previous problems. We have a, um, we, it has to compensate for the 100 up and the 363.94, is that right? 94 down minus 100, is that correct? Did I do that right? 390, that's not quite right. What's that product? I, I'm, I'm, huh? 292.4, yeah, I forgot my 292.4. And so that's a 392.4 up there. Okay, so there's your normal. And so the critical force is going to be half of that. So that critical friction force is going to be half of that, which is a 196.2. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Well, oh yes, 146, yeah, because a half of roughly 300 there. So always, <coughs> always think before you punch, and sometimes your brain and your calculator aren't in sync together. Okay, so that's the required friction force to cause it to pop loose. So how much horizontal force is there? If we write our force, sum of force equations to the right, 200 cosine your, your for net force component here is going to be 200 cosine of 30 degrees, which is 0.866 for the cosine of 30. That's a number you might as well know. How many of you knew that? 0.866. That's a good one to know. Yeah, that's radical 3 over 2. 0.866 is a good one to know, okay? Because um, they show up in textbook problems all the time. So we have 200 times that is going to be 173.2, right? 
173.2. So if you write sum of forces x now equals mass times acceleration x, we have a, a 1, what did I say, 173.2. And that's greater than the required friction force, so we do have enough to cause motion. And the friction force is opposing. Anything else in the X? I think that's it. That's got to equal the mass, which was 40 kilograms, times our acceleration X. And that should be the solution to the problem. Did I catch it all? Static or kinetic friction? Excuse me? Kinetic because it's moving. Oh, that's the static criteria. Thank you. That's the static criteria to cause break loose. And so what we need to do is come in and revise that. So keep in mind, this was for static. Matter of fact, not a bad idea. <laughs> That's your static criteria to cause it to break loose. So marking that in your notes is not a bad idea. So you then want to discard this value in your calculation of your acceleration and go with your kinetic coefficient. Now. What you could do is you could scale this critical value down, could you not, to save yourself a little extra step? Couldn't you take this times 0.4 over 0.5? And that would knock out the 0.5 and leave the 0.4? So you could take, you could take this value, I'm just showing you a little trick of the trade here. You could take this static value and multiply it by 0.4 over 0.5, in other words, eight, 80, uh, four fifths is 80 percent. So you're going to reduce that value to 80 percent of what it was. Make sense? Okay, just a little quick trick. And so, what do you get when you do that, and then you divide by 40? 173.2. One seventy three point two minus eighty percent of one forty six point two, all divided by forty. Is that the right answer? One point four six units, double check. So again, that body's not accelerating very rapidly at that instant. Okay, so I think what we'll do is uh, don't forget there's a quiz waiting for you over in the Math Resource Center. They reopen again tonight and tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. They're open 8.30 to 3.20 every day. And I'd like you to have that done by Thursday class time. Okay, so see you then. Thank you.